Well, hello. My name is Kristen Sullivan. I am the Senior Director for Educational Technology at the Kennedy School, and I'm also the director of our recently launched flagship online program known as the Public Leadership Credential, one of the uh, projects that you're going to be hearing about today. Thank you very much for coming. Um, as you can see, we have an excellent um, set, a cast of characters to talk to you about um, peer, peer learning in online environments. Um, we have Bharath Anand from um, Vice Provost for Advances in Learning, as well as a faculty member at the Business School and a Senior Associate Dean for HBS Online. So Bharath, thank you very much for joining us today. We're very happy to have you. We also have my good friend Mary Godfrey from Harvard X, but today we're not going to say she's a staff member from Harvard X. We're going to say she is a GSE student who is going to be talking about the new online pre-matriculation experience for incoming students at GSE. So Mary, thank you very much. Um, my friend Dan Spratt, who is not known as Daniel, but Dan, and we've confirmed that I go by Kristen, not Chris. Um, Dan is an instructor at DCE, as well as a professor of medicine at Maine Medical Center and the Tufts School of Medicine. So uh, Dan, thank you very much for joining us. And a partner in crime, of which there are many in the PLC, is Teddy Sforanos, who's an instruct is a uh, lecturer in public policy at the Kennedy School and also um, a faculty lead in the public leadership credential. So the way we were gonna do this today is I was gonna just sort of set the table for a few minutes and then um, invite our speakers to each have about 10 minutes to talk a little bit about peer learning and online environments. If you think of a question, how about if you jot it down and we'll just try and get through all of it. 10 minutes is always in air quotes with this sort of thing because we're gonna try and keep to 10, but who knows. We have some, um, some uh, padding there because uh, what they have to say is very interesting and I'm sure you wanna hear about it. At that point, we'll take a, um, take a minute. We'll see, do we wanna ask the panelists questions or would we like to do a little peer activity um, in the room? So if you're okay with, um, with winging it, that's how we'll do it. And then um, the hour will probably be up. Any questions? All right, let's get started. Um, what I wanted to do to start, <laughs> I only have five minutes. Let me just start at the top. I was thinking, you know, I'm no anthropologist, but um, I have a suspicion that since people came on this earth, people interact with each other. They learn from each other, they help each other learn, whether that means I'm gonna help you um, cook something, you're gonna help me learn how to build shelter in a formal schooling environment, I'm gonna have trouble with an assignment and I'm gonna ask you a question, you're gonna help me out, vice versa. Um, and so I think when you're in an in-person environment, we naturally want to help each other and we naturally seek each other out for help and to help each other. So I think that is, um, is a baseline uh, reality. Uh, and so then I started to think about, well, what about when we take it out of the physical space? How do we interact with each other in formal learning experiences as well as informal learning experiences? Um, and so I just wanted to think for a second, okay, today we're gonna talk about online environments, but what other non-face-to-face -face environments have there been over time and how has that peer interaction taken place? So thanks to the interwebs, I just did a quick Google search and I thought, wow, the first time that we were um, learning in a, a distant way was way back in the 1800s where you received something in the mail and that was a way of learning. That doesn't seem like there was a lot of peer interaction unless your neighbor also got that package in the mail and came over to your house and you talked about it. 100 years later, we moved on to uh, radio. So you could sit in your living room and listen to learning come at you. And again, how are you interacting with somebody else who was also listening to that, unless you invited your neighbor over to listen to the radio with you, which would be nice, but it's still an in-person experience. Um, a, a few years later, we moved to the same kind of concept, but in a television format. Again, not to beat um, a dead horse, but again, invite your neighbor over and watch TV with you. There might not have been any opportunity to interact virtually. It wasn't until possibly the 80s when we first had computer conferencing able distance education. That doesn't sound very friendly, but at least it was an effort. We went into the late 80s where we started to move on to the internet and in the early 90s where um, uh, browsers enabled probably more deeper learning online. Um, but the first fully online programs, and this was something interesting I wouldn't have thought of if I had to guess, NYU Online was one of the first um, fully online programs in 1998. And then I want to bring you back to me for a second. Um, I used to be a teacher, actually, in the olden days. I went to the ed school. I used to be known as Miss Lofblad. And I was running a writing center out um, a half hour from here in Medfield, Massachusetts, at Medfield High School. And I had computers in my classroom. A lot of the classrooms at that time uh, didn't have computers, but I did. 
And um, students would come into my classroom after school, and I said, what are you doing? May I help you? Do you? Are you working on your college essay? Like all that friendly stuff. And they're like, no, I'm taking an online class through virtual high school. And I just remember thinking, shut the front door. What are you doing? And they're like, well, we don't offer Russian at Medfield High School, so I'm taking Russian online or other courses like that. I just thought that was so fascinating. Sidebar, I quickly left K through 12 and got into the online space and ended up here. But, um, but anyway, uh, even in that context in the late 90s, the interaction I saw in terms of peer learning was, again, the physical. I'm doing Russian online, my friend is doing Mandarin online, we're both coming into Ms. Lothblad's classroom after school, and we're talking to each other, IRL, in real life, what the cool kids say, but they're not, there wasn't a lot of interaction on the um, online environment. So that was 20 years ago. I hope now we've done better, and we're gonna hear from our panelists today about some of the ways in which um, peer engagement and peer learning um, have taken place. In the last 10 years or so, I've been at Harvard for 15 years. Who's been here for more than 20 years? Any long timers? Remember before any of this was happening? But I think like around 10 years ago, I started hearing a lot more about online. Thank you to HarvardX. There's um, HBS Online, obviously, HMX. Uh, DCE has done so much with online, uh, both informal learning experiences and toward a degree. Uh, Chan has the low residency degree now. Um, who am I forgetting? The online pre-matriculation experiences at the Ed School, and I just learned about Zero L here at the Law School. And of course, at the Kennedy School, our big bet in online is something that Teddy's gonna tell you about called the Public Leadership Credential. So it's starting to happen, and I think this is a great moment to go from, I received a book in the mail in the 1800s to what's happening in 2019 at Harvard and how are peers interacting with each other virtually to help each other learn and um, engage with each other. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Barath to go first, if you don't mind. Here is the... Morning, everyone. Morning. So thank you, Kristen, for um, moderating this panel. Thank you all for coming. And I just wanted to... I have three slides, um, which I'd like to talk through in the next 10 minutes, and make a few observations. The first one actually picks up on... The, the last thing that Kristen says, and in fact, uh, Cecil also mentioned this. By the way, thank you for such a uh, thought-provoking morning panel. It was delightful. Um, when Cecil was talking about the, the future and, um, and the hope that online learning might uh, emulate some of the peer interactions that we can take advantage of in the physical setting. So, um, so I'll talk about HBS Online a little bit here, which was what I got involved in about seven years ago. The thinking behind HBS Online was sparked by a classroom with an architecture like this, right? So we're in the law school. These are the, this is the physical architecture to have conversations. And the thing that's most interesting about this classroom, or classrooms like this, is that sitting anywhere in the classroom, you can see everyone else, right? Without having to turn around uh, and so on. And so the architecture, in some sense, enables certain conversations that wouldn't be quite as easily possible if you had rows back to back. That was uh, the DNA of Harvard Business School as well. And when we started the online experience, what we were trying to think about is how do we recreate that peer conversation online, right? So that was really the, the, the first order uh, question. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about those technologies that Kristen was talking about is with radio and broadcast, those were broadcast media. We didn't have the possibility for peer-to-peer -peer interaction. And, um, you know, I've been studying the, the media entertainment space and how they have reacted to digital over the last 25 years. I ended up writing a book about this, which was really talking about the possibility for this spoke-to-spoke -spoke or peer-to-peer -peer interaction as being what's profoundly different about online than those earlier technologies. And yet, what was interesting to us when we started thinking about online education was you go back to the last 20 years and most of online education was still broadcast. So the question is, can we take advantage of that somehow? Um, and I'll just mention a few things on this slide. First, we had to be very intentional to put peer learning at the center of the conversation. So that whiteboard there was literally a snapshot of the whiteboard which we were scribbling stuff on for three months. And you might be able to see social learning at the top of that chart. We had broken it down to um, you know, different forms of learning, active learning, 
adaptive learning, social learning. So we were thinking intentionally about how do we make this work? And I just want to mention that because it doesn't just happen, right? It's, it's, it's not that these conversations just happen because you're online. Um, I'm always amused by newspaper companies who tell me, oh, we're in the peer-to-peer -peer space. And I say, how? And they say, we have uh, discussion forums, um, which I often label as crimes against humanity. But um, <laughs> yeah, if you spend 99% of your time thinking about the content and then 1% thinking about how to make those interactions occur, it's not going to occur. Um, the thing that was interesting was after three months of this endeavor, we had uh, three MBA students working with us who were giving us advice on how to do this. And I noticed they'd been saying something that we weren't listening to. They kept saying, um, we learn in the classroom from each other, but we also learn outside the classroom, in the lunch corridor, in the gym conversations, in study groups. And they kept talking about social learning. And what I realized was even though we were talking about it, we hadn't made it central to the platform building effort, which was particularly sobering since I'm writing this book talking about spoke-to-spoke -spoke -to -spoke interactions. That's how insidious this problem is. So we basically pivoted the entire effort to focus on social learning. And this is the first page of the HPS online platform. There's no content. It's just a global map and with pulsating bubbles. And people can see who's on in which city. And if you click on a bubble, it'll show you people's profile pictures. And then you can message them. The first day that we launched this, there were 300 people who logged in. There were 13,000 profile views. All they wanted to do was check each other out. Right? But I just want to pause there, because in some sense, we can't have conversations unless we're familiar with each other. So familiarity is almost a precondition, and that was uh, profoundly important. The, the next thing that was important is trying to think about incentives. Why would people want to talk to each other, as opposed to just looking at the content from the faculty member online? Um, how, to, how do we make it easier for people to talk to each other? Because most of the discussion threads in online forums or online courses are just hugely long. You can't figure out what topic is where. People get turned off. Um, so we realized that in the physical classroom, we actually give incentives to students. So in our courses, we say half your grade depends on class participation, meaning um, that's, a, that's a pretty strong incentive right, to talk to each other. So we said, why don't we try the same thing online? So to complete the online course, we said, Part of your grade depends on the extent to which you answer other people's questions. We didn't say whether it's 10% or 50%. That's all we said, just part of your grade. And on the first day, 75% of the students went to the peer forums. So incentives matter. Searchability matters. As opposed to having the discussion thread on the course homepage, we had it local to each page where the questions on that discussion forum are relevant to the, quest the content on that page. Again, it's such a simple thing but it just makes it much easier to search then. And then we also made it fun, because a lot of students are scared of asking questions, thinking if I ask a question, someone will say, what a stupid question. So we said, when you ask a question, tag your question. So you can label it saying, I'm asking a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> the moment you say that, you've taken away the license that I have to say it's a stupid question, right? So I mean, these are just behavioral things that we were thinking about. Um, there's one thing I just wanted to mention, which we borrowed literally from the physical classroom which is the, the famous cold call. Um, so in, in the physical classrooms, we often just call on students at random, and it's a way for keeping them attentive. By the way, what's interesting is they get really scared, not because they might say something that doesn't make sense in front of the faculty, because they're worried about what their peers might think. So we created something called the online cold call, where you're going through the course, and suddenly at random, a pop-up appears, and it says, Cecil, you've been cold called. You have a minute to answer this question. There's a clock ticking in the corner, 30 words or less, and your answer is visible to the entire cohort with your profile picture. Okay, so suddenly, it sort of becomes not just an active learning, but a social event. Uh, by the way, I will say Sal Khan has copied this feature now for the Khan Academy, which I was very proud to hear. Um, although, and this is just an observation, the effectiveness of the cold call depends on cohort familiarity. Meaning, if it's a lonely experience up until I get cold called, I sort of don't care about what my peers think. So these things must go hand in hand. Anyway, so that's basically just to give you a glimpse of the platform that was built. How has it worked? So um, first of all, in terms of the effectiveness of uh, questions and answers. So we can't have content experts or faculty intervening every time there's a question online. So we needed peer learning to work. The first three weeks, we were just looking at the questions, ready to jump in if the discussion threads went off in, in the wrong way. 
the number of times we had to jump in was precisely zero. Every question correctly answered by the peer group, okay? Uh, and this was stunning. Now, that comes with a caveat, which is it doesn't always happen on the first answer. You've got to give them space and time, just like we do in the physical classroom. So we often say when you're teaching in this kind of classroom, trust the students. Give them space to talk to each other. It's the same thing online. It's really hard not to jump in. But if you give them space, within half an hour or so, they'll have basically converged to the answer. The other is the diversity of the cohort, which is exemplified in this chart. Uh, this was someone who posted this on LinkedIn. And um, you know, I was, I was gratified to see that the bomb diffuser actually has time on his hands to take an <laughs> online course. Um, but what's more interesting about that diversity is they actually throw out ideas that we would not even think about. So in the economics course, I was talking about coupons as a way of price discrimination. Some student in Holland writes, never heard of coupons. We don't have that in Holland. <laughs> and that started a really stimulating conversation. There was another example where I was talking about McDonald's Happy Meals as a way of price discrimination. And I jokingly mentioned in the video, isn't it interesting that adults would never go by themselves to get Happy Meals in McDonald's? And then someone from Malaysia posted a picture of a huge line outside of McDonald's where there were only adults standing <laughs> to get the toys from McDonald's, right? So you start seeing that diversity in ways that are pretty profound. The third and probably most important thing is confidence and deeper understanding of the material, right? When you are forced to teach others, you actually understand it better yourselves. And students take ownership of the experience. Um, so those are some of the things that we've seen. Um, are there things that we can do more of? Um, yes. The, the three I would just throw out are group discussions and spontaneous breakouts on the platform. Uh, peer grading, which we've done to some extent, but there's still huge opportunity there, and peer tutoring. So in some sense, the live interaction comes entirely asynchronously in this platform, but there might be ways to have synchronous interactions. Um, the one thing I'll say that we were really surprised by was students then started having physical meetups outside the course content or structure just to get to know people in their different cities, saying, who's in Tokyo, who's in Bangalore, who's in Singapore, why don't we just meet? Um, this actually gave rise to something called HBSO Connect, which is an event we have once a year on campus where we invite people who've taken a course to come to campus and we run sessions for them. We send one email typically, 600 people typically show up to campus, and they fly from as far as Australia and Denmark and Brazil just for that one day. So this is the kind of human interaction that is now being built online. Um, there, there are 29 chapters now. This is community chapters across the world which have been self-organized, and all we do is literally just light, uh, a light touch guiding. The most inspiring thing that happened was in this last Connext event this May, we had a challenge for them in partnership with the Greater Boston Food Bank, saying um, there's food available, there's people who need it, how do you manage inventory, supply chain, reliability, or delivery issues. And so the CEO of Greater Boston Food Bank basically posed this challenge to the HPSO online community. You had, I believe, nine teams self-organized in different cities who basically submitted um, sort of proposals. We then convened them through HPX Live to, to talk about their proposals, and, and one was chosen as the winner where they were literally building apps to solve this problem, which is, um, which is sort of inspiring, right? You can now think about communities sort of going far beyond the online content. Um, the, the last thing I'll, I'll just show you, uh, Dan's I think gonna talk about a version of this, is the synchronous classroom at HBS Online, which is basically a physical classroom, but instead of 60 seats, we have 60 TV screens, and you can run a case discussion uh, with the only difference being you've collapsed geography, right? So you can be anywhere in the world. This is now changing executive education completely uh, for the school and potentially for the university as we start making these classrooms available to the rest of the university. By the way, the, the true test of this um, was when our dean was testing the facility with a group of people online. He walked up to one person on the wall and grilled that person for three minutes in a case discussion. He said, at the end of the three minutes, I saw her sweating. At that point, I knew this would work. <laughs> okay. uh, the other thing that happened was we ran a program of seven sessions. On the last session, people refused to log off. I mean, they were literally crying. They had developed those interactions with each other. Um, so I'll just pause there. By the way, in terms of scaling this, you have 60 on the wall. 
you can have 1,500, 3,000, 10,000 people watching the live stream and chatting through the chat bar. Um, so there's a way now to scale this as well, which is really encouraging. And we're using both platforms now uh, going forward for university-wide courses. The Harvard X team, many of, the f many of whom are already in the room, have been building out courses to take advantage of what we have. Thank you. Thanks, Bharath. It's so thought-provoking, and, um, and it's interesting. It was sort of both academic and social online and an in-person component, because we just as people can't not be together. So that's interesting. I wonder if that's going to come up with the other speakers. Um, and so with that, I'll pass it on to Mary, GSE student. Good morning, everyone. Um, so as Kristen uh, emphasized, uh, I'm here today as a learner. I think many of you know me as Mary from Harvard X as the production manager, and I'm going to put that hat aside and speak to you uh, fully and wholly just as a learner um, at the Graduate School of Education. So when um, Kristen and I were chatting, we were talking about the concept of peer learning and the idea of um, uh, learning as a peer, but also teaching as a peer. And so I tried to think about how that experience showed up for me in the How People Learn course. So very quickly, show of hands, how many people here have heard of the How People Learn course or taken the How People Learn course? Okay. And then how many have, are not so familiar with it? Okay. So bear with me for about 20 seconds for those of you in the room that know something about how people learn. This is a pre-matriculation course offered through the Graduate School of Education. Uh, it's, it's eight weeks, six modules. Uh, following two weeks working on a design proposal and then it culminated in an in-person component at the very end where we actually got to meet and greet and share with many of our peers that we were engaging with online. So that's sort of an overall format for how that experience went. Uh, a couple of other important things I think that are key to understanding what made it effective for me um, were small group cohorts. Um, those were cohorts that were designed for us to um, engage with each other on discussion forums, and they were the same set of people that we engaged with over the course of those modules, so we got to know each other over time. Um, anyway, that's sort of a, the broad strokes around some of the things that I'll show you up here on slides and also some of the format for how people learn. A few other things just I think that's important to um, hear about me as a learner, because this was so important to me on my learning journey for how people learn, is this. I'm not somebody who grew up learning through online education platforms. My pre-K through 12 experience was purely residential. Uh, at this point in my life, I am a mid-career professional, so online learning just wasn't a reflexive uh, component to how I learned over my career. Um, I also am somewhat of an introvert, so I, I'm not inclined to engage. It's just not my MO. In fact, just for fun, we don't have to do this now, but for giggles and for a laugh, you could go and find me on Twitter. I am on Twitter. And you'll find zero tweets and zero followers. And that's just by way of example of how uninclined I am to sort of get out there. So going into how people learn, um, I knew this about myself. I also knew there was going to be an expectation that there was going to be some component of this. And that actually kind of scared me. So if I can um, just show you. Um, at, at the beginning of the course, there's a learner profile you fill out, and I was so cognizant of the fact that I was going to be intimidated by this idea of, of engaging with my peers in discussion forums. I actually set a challenge for myself in this learner profile, that I would challenge myself to post one interesting idea or observation a week. That was how I was going to try to overcome this kind of reticence. Okay, so hopefully at the end of this, we'll find out how I did. Okay. Um, so, just to um, move a little forward here, what I, as I thought about the theme of this particular talk, uh, you know, I wrestled with, with, you know, what could I sort of tell you about peer learning and my experience of it, because there were so many rich opportunities for peer learning in this course. I landed on three approaches that I thought jumped out at me that were really effective for me, but I just want to say that there are a lot of opportunities in this course for this sort of engagement. Um, so again, show of hands, how many people are familiar with Yellow Dig? So Yellowdig was the digital tool that functioned as the discussion board for this course. So um, there were sort of two elements to the way that we engaged with Yellowdig. Um, one was uh, required postings that we had to put onto the discussion forum each week. Uh, each week we had two prompts that we were to respond to. 
uh, one new insight that you learned from the course material in that module, and then one thing you might carry forward in your careers or in your um, future educational endeavors. What I liked about this for me is that it provided some grounding and accountability for me as a, as a learner in the experience. Um, grounding because we were given things like um, best practices for how to post, you know, word, word count, that sort of thing. Um, grounding because I got to know my peers over the course of the modules. And accountability because I had to do it, right? So unbeknownst to me, when I set that challenge for myself, I was actually already going to succeed. That was sort of a fun little takeaway for me. The second way in which uh, I engaged with Yellow Dig uh, was in an optional capacity. So sprinkled throughout the modules were uh, little moments where you were invited to go ahead and connect to each other in your cohort on Yellow Dig around a concept that jumped out at you. And again, these were optional, but I think that the optional was something that was made easy because we were already in the practice of doing it due to the fact that we had to do these required postings each week. So to my surprise, I actually went ahead and posted optionally. I mean, I didn't have to, but I was so inspired and I felt so comfortable in that space by module four that I was actually back and forth with some of my peers. Um, what you're looking at is a little bit of reflection and connection, um, and it's actually a couple of um, my peers in this cohort going back and forth about this idea of hidden curriculum. Um, turns out, just as a fun fact, to these, both of these peers of mine are in classes of mine right now at the Graduate School of Education, and one of them I am locked in with for a group project for the rest of the semester, and I think it's just very, very meaningful as we talk about the networks that happen, the trust building that happens, and how that can um, carry forward into your face-to-face -face experiences. So the sort of final kind of um, peer learning moment for me that was very significant was the final project. And a little bit about the final project, and then I'll just show you some of some, um, the work that I was doing in that final project. It was a design proposal that we were to create. We were paired with somebody in our cohort, and we were invited to figure out amongst ourselves how we were going to engage. Um, and what my uh, peer and I landed on was we would just share our notes with each other via uh, Google Docs, right? We went back and forth over email, and we said, okay, I'll give my comments to you, and you can give my comments back. Um, I want to pause here and say that I'm not sure I could have gotten to that comfort level of feeling like I could give my peer feedback. I don't know, I don't know that I could have played teacher to my peer had I not already been stepping through these very intentional um, exercises through the discussion forums and, and through those opportunities to connect and reflect. So this is not exciting in terms of a slide, but this is sort of a little bit of you know, the commenting that we're doing back and forth on the um, final design proposal. Another sort of important point, too, I think, is that we were really set up to give each other structured and, and significant feedback. You don't exactly see it in the comments, but it was meaningful. Again, I don't think we could have gotten there had we not had six weeks of material leading up to that. And again, that included some of the very necessary um, exercises that were going on in the discussion forums. So um, how did I do on my goal? Or my challenge, rather? I, I, I did it, right? I did it. And I was really enthused by it. Um, Again, I didn't know that I was going to do it anyway. I didn't find out until I was in the middle of it, or starting it rather, that I was going to be required to do this um, posting and that sort of stuff. But it was very invigorating to actually be able to meet that challenge, very invigorating for me to interact with my peers and share ideas, and very invigorating to then, in turn, meet them in person at the, um, in, in, in school now and, and get to kind of share with them and laugh about some of the things that we put up there. And oh my God, I can't believe it. What did I say? I can't even, that, that was actually really smart of me. <laughs> so just to wrap up and before I hand it over to Daniel, I just want to say that, um, or that some of the kind of ideas that have been surfacing this morning, uh, things around familiarity, um, I'm hearing words like team culture, um, uh, incentives, you know, in, in my case, I think those incentives were the required posts in order to participate. You have a certain grade and you have to make sure that you did these things. Um, and sort of networks. I think that, that, that those are really important words as we think about peer learning, both as our own learning, but also as we are teachers to our peers. So, thank you. Thanks, Mary. A, a couple of 
thought strike me, and then we'll pass it on to Dan. But um, again, I'm hearing about uh, the in-person component as well as an online component. But my mind is sort of um, tipping toward it's a porousness. There isn't like online versus in-person, but it's just a porousness. Also, thank you for sharing how you self-identify as an introvert. I wouldn't have thought that that would be a factor in an online experience. Um, in terms of, I would have expected that an online experience might have been a safe space for an introvert. So it was really, thank you for sharing that facet of it. Um, that, that really just, it's gonna give me food for thought for later. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Dan to talk about DCE. Yeah, thanks. So good morning. Uh, and first I'd like to thank Kristen and the organizers for putting together this conference as well as this session. And second, I want to say I'm not as much of an introvert as Mary. I have five followers on Twitter <laughs> <laughs> and a few postings <laughs> and tweets. <laughs> uh, so I'm fortunate to have one of my jobs in a uh, setting that encourages and supports the innovative use of technology in enhancing teaching, and that's the extension school. Um, the, I teach science courses um, at the Extension School, uh, endocrine physiology and evolutionary reproductive biology. Uh, I also teach medical students and residents at the Tufts Medical School system. Now, at the Extension School, one of the chief aims is to nurture the peer-to-peer -peer learning among a group of students with differing in base of knowledge and differing in comfort with engaging. In addition, we work with a slightly different setting than we've talked about so far. It's a hybrid setting. Now, how many of you are familiar with the Helix classrooms? Great, okay. And uh, so this is also one of the audience response systems that we still use, uh, in addition to Poll Everywhere. <laughs> uh, the, um, so the Helix classroom has three sets of students. The one is the in-class students, like you are here right now. Uh, the second is the live students joining us through Zoom, like you saw that huge panel of students. And the third is the on-demand students who watch the videos of the lectures. Um, so uh, the idea is to have them all involved and all involved in pure um, learning. So a sense of community and comfort, as you both mentioned, is really important in this. And we start off with that with uh, two things. One is we assign pre-work for every lecturer to help them get to the uh, level playing ground when we start into the lecture. And that can be you know, a reading or a 15 to 20 minute video or both. The other thing is that they are uh, create all create profiles like you mentioned um, for so that they get to know each other and the profiles have to have the picture going with it. The first year I did this, maybe 10% of the students did the profile. Next year I assigned one point to their final grade. 100% did it, okay? And you, know, you don't have to have a lot of incentive, but incentive works. Um, so uh, after the pre-work, I also ask a couple questions at the beginning of the class through poll everywhere just to make sure we're all on the same page. Now the class uh, consists of segments of didactic presentation material that average maybe 15 to 20 minutes, uh, sometimes less, rarely more. And these are interspersed with breakout sessions uh, that uh, where students are uh, break down into small groups to discuss various questions or scenarios. The breakout sessions last four to six minutes, and we actually have four to six of these breakout sessions for every two hour class, so there's a lot of them. And uh, the timing of these is intended to optimize the attention span and concentration throughout those two hours. Uh, the, each breakout session is followed by a reporting session where spokespersons for each of the small groups provide a piece to answer uh, the question or scenario that was put forward. And I cold call on them to be uh, spokespersons. And, uh, <clears throat> and so every student has ample uh, opportunity in the course to be a spokesperson. Now I do give them the opportunity to have a lifeline so they can assign somebody else as a spokesperson. Uh, and I find that's fairly frequent in the first week or two, but by the middle of the term, nobody's using the lifeline anymore, okay? Um, okay, <clears throat> so uh, 
at the same time, we have our demand students who are watching the video, and uh, I ask the demand students to pause the video while they work through the uh, questions or the uh, scenario, and they have their answers before they restart the video and watch the reporting session. Uh, I should also mention that in class, the breakdown groups, and this is actually an idea Kristen gave us, the breakout groups are combined with the Zoom online live students with the in-class students, and I'll show you an example of that. Um, so uh, I'm going to then, oh, we have our, my first slide up here. So this is an example of a typical over at the extension school Helix classroom. And uh, you can see uh, uh, this is a view from where I am with a podium there looking out over the students way back to that screen in the back. And that screen in the back is going to be where our students show up uh, that are joining us through Zoom. And uh, uh, they uh, are visual and we can talk to them like you mentioned before with Zoom so I can have conversations back and forth with them. And uh, you will see also on the podium, there's another screen. Their faces will be there too, where I can read their names so uh, I can call on them by name. Okay. Uh, just above that screen, you will notice a camera. And that camera is what brings the Zoom students into the classroom. And this is the view that they have, looking down that, up to the front of the room across their fellow students who are in class. And you can see on the uh, left is the um, screen that is PowerPoint presentation is. On the right is the screen where another screen where the Zoom students' faces are, and they can talk and talk back and forth with the students in class. And then in the middle is a blackboard where we work through the reporting session. And uh, my experience is the same as yours, is that I was surprised that when they do these peer uh, groups and do the reporting session, they basically always get all the right answers of the questions. But the other thing is, they come up with the right answers that I didn't even think about. So I'm learning during this peer-to-peer -peer learning too. So it's been really nice. Now, this is my Thursday night class uh, uh, getting ready uh, just before a lecture. And you can see on that screen in the back, the students, uh, the Zoom students' faces are beginning to appear and that's going to be filled up with Zoom students. And uh, this is one of our breakout sessions. And uh, you can see the faces of the Zoom students are gone. They have descended into their breakout groups. And so they're online in these breakout groups. And you'll also notice just below that screen, uh, there is a student with looking at his computer that's isolated from the other students with headphones on. He's joined into the uh, Zoom breakout sessions with the online students. So there, we're mixing the uh, <coughs> online students with the live students in class in each one of these breakout sessions. And then the last thing we're going to do this term to enlarge this um, <coughs> is, and all these things we do are enabled by the extension school. And uh, we're going to add um, <coughs> iPads on stands that will be on the table around the in-class uh, breakout group. So each of the Zoom students will have their own iPad be able to join in with the group in class. So to further integrate this. So these breakout, so, uh, these breakout sessions are progressive through the term. We talk about comfort. When I start off, the first breakout session is really easy to make sure everybody's comfortable getting their feet wet. So for an example of a first question will be, uh, name a hormone, or name a gland that makes a hormone, or name a tissue that makes a hormone. And I, <laughs> we get almost 100% involvement on that. Um, then uh, as the term progresses, these sessions, these scenarios will become more complex, layering new information upon previously um, presented information. Uh, so, for example, in my endocrine class, uh, something that I might ask midway through the term is, imagine yourself running the Boston Half Marathon or the 10K, and it's a hot day and you're sweating. Think of all the physiologic responses in your body that are enabling you to run that. And then when you get to the drink table and you're offered water or an electrolyte solution, think of how your choice is going to change your physiologic responses. 
which is way harder than what's a hormone, okay? okay. And my very last class ends with a one-hour um, breakout reporting session that presents two complex scenarios that um, uh, the students will have to draw on information that has been presented to them throughout the term. So an example of that in the undergrad class is first, uh, the scenario is imagine that despite the advice of your parents, you've decided to go to Pamplona for the running of the bulls. <laughs> Yeah, and when those bulls get released and you start running, what are all your physiologic responses that allow you to survive? Okay. Um, and they all think of them pretty quickly. Uh, the, then we have a breakout of the reporting session where we work out through the board the complex reactions and the interactions for all these responses that they've learned through the term. Then I proceed to the second example, which is even a little bit more complex, be typically something like, imagine you have a critically ill patient in the critical care unit, now bringing them into my world a little bit, and uh, that patient has a severe infection, low blood pressure, and is not doing well. Imagine all the additional responses, besides running at Pamplona, that that patient is having physiologically to survive. And then we fill up the rest of the board with those responses. So, uh, so the breakout sessions not only are really a core part of this class for teaching, but for the peer-to-peer -peer community and teaching each other. But they provide limited opportunity for the on-demand students. And involving the on-demand students in this peer-to-peer -peer learning and community of the class, I think is one of the most difficult challenges. So that's one of the areas that we're working with the Extension School on uh, developing. Uh, they've provided us with uh, uh, four tools so far that we're using. First is online small groups uh, uh, that uh, will have a project twice uh, per term. So the project is to uh, generate a detailed report on a specific subject. And there'll be uh, four to five students in each of these groups. They'll be mixed between on-demand Zoom students and in-class students. So they'll be mixed together and working on this. Each student will be assigned an area of expertise that they're supposed to learn with this topic. They will share that expertise with the other uh, members of the group. And then they'll synthesize these different areas into a concluding statement. So that's, that's it. Took us a while to figure out how to do this when people are thinking it's fair, uh, but we've gotten good feedback on this. Uh, the second is Yellow Day. Again, fortunately, I don't have to go in Yellow Day. We basically use it the same way that Mary does, uh, but that's an integral part of our course, and we assign, assign substantial uh, number of uh, points to this so that we get robust involvement. But even if you only assign one point, Yellow Dig uh, has uh, really enthusiastic involvement from the students where they can pose ideas, uh, questions, and uh, even articles, and then they respond to other people's questions uh, <clears throat> and ideas by expanding on them or answering them. And we virtually never uh, enter into this to answer the questions. It's all done by the students. Yeah, um. Do you mind if I jump in for one second with a reflection? I have my eye on the clock, too, so I'm sort of doing my moderator thing for a second. But I did hear um, in what you're talking about um, both uh, instructional moves as well as technology to facilitate this peer-to-peer -peer learning. Yeah. And I just want to comment for people that haven't taught before, it's hard enough to teach to physically present students while you're preparing a lesson and getting your comments out and allowing the students to learn um, with you, in front of you, etc. And then in the simultaneous delivery that DCE is known for, that, that brings it up a level between the physically present students and the live online students. And I just was so struck by the fact that you also are talking to the people who are watching the re recorded versions of this simultaneously delivered course to work into your, as an instructional move, pause this, do the work, and then come back. Yeah. I just think that that's fantastic because it's hard enough to teach, and then it's hard enough to teach in simultaneous delivery, but to also honor the people that are watching the recorded versions is just, uh, that's just really um, a dance that is not a simple thing to master. And then the second thing that I heard you say was about the variety of technologies that you use, both to facilitate the teaching and learning, but to facilitate the engagement um, across the peers. I'm glad that you are taking me up on this idea to mix up the, um, the physically present and virtual learners in groups, and thanks 
to Zoom for facilitating that, but also with Yellow Dig, you as well, Mary, mentioned a technology that helps. And I feel like a lot in these peer learning and online environments, it's a combination of the pedagogy, but also the technology. And obviously, Bharath, you mentioned that a lot, and uh, HBS Online technologies really in invite that. Um, in the interest of time, if you don't mind, um, we could come back at the end, but I want to give Teddy um, a I, moment. I actually was down to five seconds. Five seconds, okay. all right. So the last two things are, uh, that we use uh, an online thing for the on-demand students where they can comment, make, record comments and questions as they watch the video, and then we incorporate those into the following lecture or review session. And that was the last thing I was going to say. Oh, thank okay, you. Thank I'm you. sorry that I cut you off then. I was just worried about the, um, the clock looming in my eye. But thank you very much. Um, and Teddy, I'm going to pass on the clicker to you, sir. Thank you. This is till 11.30. What's that? We're till 11.30. Uh-oh. OK. Good morning. I had to do it because everyone else did. Um, <laughs> my name is Teddy Sveronos. I'm, I'm representing here the public leadership credential at the Kennedy School, just to give you a sense of context and scale. Uh, our current run of three of the six courses has about 450 learners across the three of them, so about 150 of them each. Um, and so we think of it as sort of this middle space between a residential course and a MOOC, and that's a thing that I'm going to kind of return to a couple times. Um, I want to take my first of very few minutes to acknowledge all the people that are involved in creating and running PLC. So first, certainly, our illustrious leader, Kristen, and Dan, who is not here at the moment. Um, I'm one of three faculty leads across the three domains of the public leadership credential. And then we have the course design team, the learning designers who were involved in creating this thing. So a thing that's going to come up a lot is that uh, peer learning is at the absolute center of this credential and how we decided to plan it. So the people designing these courses, uh, uh, had a huge role on that. And then also the team that's actually involved in delivering it. And speaking of the folks that are involved in delivering it, our small and growing group of TAs who have uh, helped across these courses. So actually, I think a lot of them are here. So people, anyone on the screen right now, can you stand up for a second? Thank you very much. So first of all, thank you very much. Second of all, note who they are so you can ask them questions afterwards because they know a lot more about this than I do. Um, I, there are two reasons for me to put this up. One is that I'm extremely grateful for all the work these folks have done. Two is that a thing that has become clear to me in administering this uh, credential is that peer learning is work. It's a lot of work. It takes effort. It takes time. Uh, we were tempted at trying to think, well, we can scale this kind of uh, uh, arbitrarily, right? The marginal cost of additional learner is zero. I've come to believe, at least in the way that we have administered this, that it really does take people and time and energy to make peer learning work in a good way. It's not really a substitute for, you know, we don't have the resources to do this, so let's just have people learn from each other. Um, to that point, uh, the reason for, the, for us incorporating peer learning so deeply into PLC is twofold. One, as evidenced by the existence of this conference, there's lots of evidence to suggest that uh, peer learning and peer instruction can be incredibly helpful for learning outcomes. That I think is sort of goes without saying. But the second is that when we were trying to decide what we wanted our offering to be, we thought about this notion of signature pedagogies, which is to say, what are things that people who graduate from this program need to be able to do in their work, in their lives, right? What do we want a graduate of this to do? Um, and what became clear to us is that all of those things involve peer learning and peer instruction, right? So being able to learn from cases, get deeply into an example and sort of elucidate all the different nuances of it. Uh, talking to one another and collaborating on projects is going to happen constantly to these folks as policymakers and decision making. Excuse me. And then finally, being in the role of a decision maker made clear to us that we need to incorporate things like simulations into the, group, into the, into the uh, 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 credential in terms of trying to be in the role of the decision maker, walking through different choices and how they affect your outcomes, that was also a really big part of it. So those three notions, right, learning from your peers, learning from case studies, and learning from simulations, all necessitated a kind of peer learning that we thought was really important. So to that end, we decided that we're going to kind of keep this central to the program. So the way that it works is that we have these five week long courses. Within those courses, you are in a group of about five learners and that's your group for all five weeks. You have the same group, the same people, you collaborate on the same projects over time. Um, the reason for that was that we were trying to think of trying to be able to create the kind of collaboration and knowledge that we were trying to, that we were aiming for to begin with. So Prath's point uh, earlier that you can't learn from one another until you know each other. This is a way to get people to really truly know each other. So the way that PLC works is in addition to quizzes and individual assignments and things like that, every week has a group assignment where you 
collaborate on a project, you work on a Google Doc or something like that, you meet on Zoom and you submit a group assignment every week. So that involves getting really deeply into the kinds of case studies we were talking about, talking about the simulations and reflecting, and in my case, learning about how to use data and make data usable as a policymaker. So this is just an example of one of the assignments that we have that I think uh, sort of takes into account a bunch of different parts of it. This is sort of a Google Doc template. Uh, it's a case study, so it involves one of our very many uh, faculty guests, speakers who we have in our courses, one of whom is David Eves. They've been a really huge part of it. Uh, you're supposed to name all the people that you worked with and sort of indicate who was actually involved in the sort of decision-making process, and I'll get back to that in a second. Um, so the, the, the tough part about this is that we're asking groups to self-negotiate. So we help them sort of find each other in terms of timing and location and stuff like that. At that point, they're sort of left to self-manage. So built into these assignments are these moments of metacognition. So in the first assignment, they discuss and establish group norms. They talk about what they think their group needs to look like and what it needs to do um, as part of the, of the assignment. A couple weeks later, they reflect on how it's going, what should change, what, what should sort of be happening with the group work. And at the end, we ask them to identify what we call exceptional contributors. So not just who was really great, who was really good in your group, who was an exceptional contributor to your group. So that has a small effect sort of on, on your performance in the course and things like that, but it's also a chance to acknowledge that different people in the group have different abilities to contribute, have different time commitments to contribute, and acknowledging the sort of hard work of the people uh, that had a bigger sort of role in that. Part of that involves a lot of TA work. So we have TAs that are grading each of these group assignments. Very few of them are just multiple choice questions. Those are quizzes. The group assignments involve writing. So TAs are providing feedback to groups. TAs are grading groups. And TAs are kind of also playing an informal role in helping to deal with group dynamics. Because as you can imagine, you know, working with people is hard. Working with people is messy. Maybe people aren't listening to you or you don't like someone or something like that, and that kind of persists across the, across the course. So helping to manage that and helping to kind of deal with that is a big part of the course. I will say that in our experience, at least after talking uh, with Neil, um, that hasn't come up nearly as much as we were kind of worried that it would at first. Be groups are sort of able to self-manage and create uh, dynamics wherein they're able to collaborate together, but that ends up being kind of a big part of uh, the role of a TA. And I'll say even, so two of the three uh, uh, domains are about leadership and policy design. So that involves a lot of simulations and case studies and things like that. Even in my evidence and design course, we have a final test at the end of the course and that takes place in two stages. They do it individually, then the group assignment is that they do it again as a group and submit their answers as a group and then we can sort of compare, we can essentially see did they do better as a group than they did individually and we actually construct a metric for how well they collaborated. So part of incorporating evidence and decisions into the course involves creating metrics for collaboration and having people reflect on how well they were able to collaborate. Um, I, again, I'm running really short of time, on time, so I want to say a couple of best practices that we've come across for people who um, are thinking of doing something similar to what we've been describing. As I said, the role of the TAs for informal support is a really huge part. We found that designating head TAs, so somebody who sort of helps coordinate and calibrate across TAs can be really helpful. Um, making clear to TAs sort of what is to be expected and what isn't in these sorts of contexts. So, so learners are coming to them with lots and lots of questions, both in terms of the content of the course and also advice on managing group dynamics and things like that. TAs have had to learn to kind of adapt to that, which can be quite different from what they do in a residential course. Uh, the last thing I'll say, because I was talking very fast, is that uh, we were taught, we, we, we've been soliciting uh, feedback from learners to sort of see what they liked and didn't like about the course. And a recurrent thing, there's one learner in particular who we said, what was the high point of the course? And they said, the group was by far the best part. We, I've continued collaborating with them after the course ended. It's been wonderful to get to know these people from all around the world with lots of different experiences and things like that. And then we said, what was the low point of the course? And they said, definitely the group part. <laughs> the group part was really difficult. There were times when we really disagreed and we had to argue and kind of get into the thick of that. That to us is also an end in itself, right? We're both trying to teach them the content and teaching them the ability to make decisions and to work in this group collaborative environment. Uh, so that's all I'll say, so we have some time for questions, but very happy to talk about more of this after and certainly all the people that uh, have had a huge role on this. Thank you.
Thanks, Teddy. You know what um, strikes me when you just said that, the best and the worst, the triumph and tr the tragedy, and how meaningful the group work was. Um, so last fall, we um, piloted the first round of courses, and um, we had this great idea to have a super learner in each of the courses um, that were Kennedy School affiliates. And not only did they participate in the courses, but they gave us feedback. Um, on being a learner and what the experience was. And I recently ran into one of those super learners, and so we're on the third running of these first set of courses. She's still in touch with her group. So that is a real, like, that's a relationship that's persevering past the end of that pilot course that happened um, almost a year ago. So that's interesting that um, the best are also the hardest in terms of the people element of it. Um, well, so, uh, so I would like to thank the panel. We have a parlor game moment. We only have a minute more. I was trying to honor the concept of peer learning by giving an opportunity for you to turn to a neighbor and talk and digest what you heard. But in the interest of time, I will just put these up on the screen for you to think about, because you can find each other later. Um, or you can engage with each other online, shoot an email, have an in-person meetup. Think about and process what you heard today.